Welcome. I am reading from my book, A Gracious Space Fall. There are three books in this trilogy. Each one has 50 daily readings designed to help you sustain your homeschooling commitment. We have been reading from A Gracious Space Fall all the way back starting in August, and now we're in November and we're winding up because we're on day 44. And today's reading is called Value Your Children's Voice. We talk quite a bit about writing voice in Brave Writer. We want the writing your kids do to sound like them, to have their vocabulary, inflection, quirky personality, and sense of humor. We don't want them to sound like a copy of Aesop or the writer of XYZ Curriculum. We don't want them to produce rote writing where no one can tell who wrote it, so devoid of the voice. So we start with free writing. But what happens when we give free freedom to express and little shows up? What if what we find on the page is lifeless and dull and the other utter opposite of what we hear in the bathtub or at an amusement park? Even worse, what if what comes out really does in fact sound like your child, but it's lifeless and dull according to you and feels like the barest beginnings of original thought? Time to back up a step. Writing voice is two words. The real word we want to explore is voice all by itself. Peter Elbow, my guru, describes it this way. Most children have real voice, but then lose it. It is often just plain loud, like screeching or banging a drum. It can be annoying or wearing for others. Shh is the response we get to the power of real voice. But in addition, much of what we say with real voice is difficult for those around us to deal with. Anger, grief, self-pity, even love for the wrong people. When we are hushed up from those expressions, we lose real voice. Here's where we sometimes go wrong as parents. We are busy. Our children are young and inexperienced. When they risk saying what they really think in the ways they want to really say what they think, we sometimes move into what I call civilize the savages mode. We are more worried about the appearance of what they say than what it is, in fact, they are saying. If your children develop the habit of shutting down their real ideas, thoughts, preferences, wishes, and dreams around you, they will also turn off real voice. Then, when you go to writing with them, they will turn to you and expect you to tell them what words ought to fill the page, just like they now wait for you to show them what thoughts are acceptable to say out loud. Writing is a risk, but so is speaking. We must create space for both the prudent, acceptable, makes mama proud words and the, oh, I hope she doesn't really feel that way words. We need to pause and let the rumble of language flow through our kids verbally, and they must know that you are interested, receptive, and open-minded enough to hear it without freaking out in order for them to find their writing voices. You can start today, eye contact in a focused minute of conversation where you really hear what one of your kids is saying is the beginning of fostering an environment where what your child means to say becomes the norm for what is written. You also may have to change your own perceptions of what writing is. It may be that you use an artificial voice when you write. The one the teacher told you sounded more grown up, or the one that keeps you from being a, perceived as impolite, or the one you use to project a cheery disposition. Maybe you don't even write because the risk feels too great and you avoid it. Take some time to explore how much space there is in yourself, in your children, and in your home to express authentic writing voice. Verbally first, in writing second. See what you can do to expand that space. Baby steps. You look angry. Want to tell me about it? Want to yell about it? Your giggly silliness is cracking me up. I want to be as silly as you. It's okay to be really sad right now. Tell me about that. Oh, I hate that too sometimes. You are so smart using all those big words. 
I would love to hear you tell me more about that story. Go for it. I want every tiny detail instead of insisting on summary. See what happens. I know for me, I have to put my phone down and walk away from the computer. I also find that it's easy to tune out my kids when the topic doesn't interest me or they are struggling to find the words. I have to remind myself to pay attention and to care. You can't do it every time, but you can do it some of the time for each child in a rotating way. Be mindful and conscious. Quote of the day, your voice is damped out by all the interruptions, changes, and hesitations between the consciousness and the page. In your natural way of producing words, there is a sound, a texture, a rhythm, a voice, which is the main source of power in your writing. This voice is the force that will make a reader listen to you, the energy that drives the meaning you seek to convey to your readers. Peter Elbow. Sustaining thought. Let your voice be heard one word at a time. Okay. So this bugs me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So writing voice. It's the same voice that greets you every morning in the kitchen. It's the same one who yells and screams at a sibling in frustration. It's the same one that you eagerly recorded in a notebook when they made a funny sentence or used grammar incorrectly or misspoke a word that they should know how to say. Writing voice comes from that same originary place. And when your kids are doing quote unquote academic writing, the most interesting part of what they'll contribute in any piece of writing is that voice. Now that voice doesn't have to express opinion or fact exclusively. If you are writing an academic paper, lo and behold, in the humanities, they actually expect you to show up on the page a little bit. You're supposed to disclose what we call social location, who you are, where you are, what this moment in time is in relationship to you so that we know what kind of personality or personal outlook you bring to your analysis. That's something that became super current in the 90s. It was to overturn the notion of objectivity, that somehow you could write a piece and not show up in it, and all of your perspectives were objective. We know that's no longer possible. People can't be 100% objective. It's not possible. They bring with them their upbringing, their background, even when you're being conscious, even when you're trying to avoid making that be a part of the piece. So when we talk about writing voice, what we're talking about is the fact that your writing is going to sound like you. Isn't that something? It's going to sound like you. It's not going to sound like somebody else, and it really shouldn't. But we have all kinds of registers in our writing voices. We can be more formal and polite. We can be informal and use insider language with the people who share our perspective, our beliefs. We can write a rant where we're just letting it rip, saying exactly what we think and looking to humiliate the other position. Or we can write with restraint, trying to find the voice that enables multiple perspectives to enter the dialogue and yet still contend for our own perspective using evidence resisting the temptation to eviscerate the opponent or to use insider terminology. So writing voice doesn't exclude the opportunity to change how you sound. You can have a different register, but it's still going to be you doing the speaking. You're still going to be the one showing up on the page. Your natural vocabulary, the way you generate insight, the unique perspective you bring to everything that you study and read. Does that make sense? Are you understanding where I'm going here? This is very important because there is a big emphasis, I think, on homeschooling, well, not just in homeschooling, in school too, on schooling, educating our children into sounding a certain way, like imitating some other writer or following a formula that results in a certain kind of eloquence or a certain sound. And yet, when we do that, we tell our children 
that the who they are-ness of their personality is not welcome on the page. And you know what? When I feel forced to not be myself, I get tired. If I have to go into a setting that demands from me a lot of um, self-management, I wear out. Like, have you ever remembered, can you remember standing in the reception line maybe at your wedding or at a graduation party or someone threw you a surprise party and suddenly everyone takes their reference cues from you? What happens next? How you treat people? And there's a certain gratitude you're supposed to express for their presence and for this event and for this experience. And really, maybe all you wanted to do was just like go hang out with friends. Just, you know, unwind, relax, celebrate. But you really can't. You've been put in this role of hostess or host. And you're supposed to be grateful. Well, you know why you're tired at the end of those wonderful experiences? Because you are in self-management the whole time. No matter how beautiful the whole exterior of the experience was. And no matter how much you're proud of what you created. When we bring in a lot of self-management and we start excluding our natural perspective, we can feel exhausted. So when we're asking our children to write, if we have them focus too much on how they sound, what they say, what structure they say it in, what sequence they put the ideas in, we start to create this exhaustion. And then we wonder why they say, I'm tired and I don't feel like writing. But what if we just take off the lid and we give them permission to start out with what they have to say in whatever way they need to say it? And they start to get in touch with the subterranean currents of thought. Because isn't that what academic writing is about? Academic writing is not about figuring out how you can match the expectations of a professor. That's not its goal. The goal in the best classes, anyway, is to help you explore your relationship to the subject so that you grow and learn, so that you integrate more perspectives into the whole that makes up you. And when you're writing an essay and you're learning how to narrate or to include those other perspectives, it's not going to go well. There's going to be a mixture between your natural voice and imitating other people and synthesizing all of it to create some kind of, I don't know, five paragraphs, five pages, 15 pages that suit that environment. So we always wind up with this mixture. But the kids who do the best in writing are the ones who first know what the mixture is how much of what they're writing feels like their authentic point of view using their natural vocabulary so that when they integrate these new ideas and more vocabulary they don't know as well, they're starting from a firm foundation. They do know how to self-express. They're not just lost again saying, well, for this environment, I got to start over because I don't know how to write. Right? Isn't that what happens? We always keep starting over because we don't know how to write because we're not in touch with our own capacity to write. All right, hold on, got a drink. Peter Elbow is totally my favorite writing instructor. He has books like Writing Without Teachers, Writing With Power, Vernacular Eloquence, Everyone Can Write. And he's an academic through and through came from uh, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, is Professor Emeritus from there, and was a national phenom in the 70s and 80s, all around writing voice. I grew up reading him because my mother is a professional writer, and she kept his books on her shelf. When I first re-entered the world of writing as an adult, I wanted to move into professional writing. I wasn't looking to be a school teacher. I wanted to get published, and the first book my mom handed me was Writing with Power. I started reading this book, and in the margins, you can see my original notes, I say things like, wait, this is how I write, or I didn't know that this is how other people write. I write this way too. 
there's a feeling of uniqueness when you are in your own writing voice because it feels like you are following the pattern of your thoughts and you are bringing about this organic new creation through a process that's very personal. What Peter Elbow demonstrated in this book to me, however, is that people who write from their natural voices go through a somewhat characteristic process, fine-tuned for each individual personality. So what I found was this. The universal thread that ties together natural writers is giving yourself permission to write whatever the heck you want when you're at the beginning of writing any piece of writing. It doesn't start with a finished outline in your imagination where you just fill in the blanks on the page. It doesn't start with really knowing what you want to say and already having the points perfectly formed. It doesn't start with following what somebody else tells you to write. Stephanie asks, what age does this apply to? All ages? Was there ever a time when your child didn't speak and the system you used to teach them to speak was to tell them what to say and in what order and that they had to have a plan of what they wanted to communicate before they took the risk of speech? Writing is the same way. The first risk to put anything on a page, a squiggly line, a scribble, a set of letters that don't mean words, that's writing voice. That's the beginning of a writing life. Children don't need to know how to spell and punctuate to write. Katrin, my youngest, I have five kids, my youngest is now 20. And when she began writing, she could not read. And she read from age five all the way, I mean, wrote, excuse me, wrote from age five all the way to age 10 when she finally started reading. How is this possible, you ask? Well, all writing is, is hooking up the mind with a transcription tool. The transcription tool could be you. You could be jotting down the great things she says and preserving them in writing. But that wasn't enough for Katrin. She needed a pen and a paper. She was around writers in her family. She knew there was a magic in that transaction. So what did she do? She just filled up pages with scribbles, and then they turned into separations. Really fascinating. You can see it in her earliest work. There is like this all the way across the page on lines. And then all of a the sudden, there are breaks. And then another break. Because somewhere along the line, her literacy grew. And she saw that nothing was connected all the way across the page. There were spaces between these clusters. Then she started learning the alphabet. Now she had clusters of alphabet across the page. And you know what she told us? These books are secret. No one can read them because I don't want you to know what's in them. She was thinking words while her hand was moving. For her, she was writing. For us, she was writing, but we didn't know the secret code. We couldn't decode what she was putting on the page. But for Katrin, the mind and the hand were coordinated, and she was giving expression to what was happening inside on a sheet of paper. By the time she read, she was so comfortable in that mode that her writing just literally took off from there. In fact, I can't really think of a time when Katrin was uncomfortable with writing. And let me go further. Writing isn't her favorite thing. It's not like she went into a writing field. She's a linguistics major, okay? So yes, language is important to her, but she's not like some of her siblings who need to write poems, who are constantly arguing on Reddit, who write long Facebook treatises. And even in college, her main enjoyment around language is dissecting language. It's mastering foreign languages. It's understanding the grammar and structure of language much more than writing papers. And yet the full person of who Katrin is is available to her in writing because there was never a time when writing wasn't a tool that she could use for her benefit. Now, not all kids will do this. 
Not everyone sees the world that way. She happens to really love the coordination of the tool and that spoken expression. Some kids really don't like the tool. It hurts their hand. They really are afraid to put things down on the page because they've been conditioned in their families or in their schools that until it's spelled correctly, it's not as valuable. Or until they know how to summarize, all this detail is really irrelevant. You know, we have them read a book and we say, write something about the book. And then the child goes straight for the most interesting part of the book and writes it in masterful detail. And we read this great description of this very tiny scene that happened in chapter eight. And we think, well, he didn't do the assignment. He doesn't know how to write. And then we, we are crestfallen. And instead of seeing the brilliance of this detailed depiction, we say to ourselves, well, is there a tool out there that teaches summary? My kid's terrible at summarizing. And we don't even realize that summary is an adult skill. Kids can't do it. It's a kind of skill that requires an ability to take the bird's eye look. But when you're a child, you haven't read enough books, watched enough movies, been in enough conversations about the structure of a book to take the bird's eye view. The only thing you know is the part of the book that was the most interesting to you. And amazingly, because they are not synthesizing and summarizing at every turn, the detail children retain is astonishing. You know, their hard drive is not full. <laughs> they can take in new information and really hold on to a whole bunch of details and then reproduce them for you beautifully. Sometimes so much detail, you can't remember where that took place in the book. You know why? Because you're an adult and you went straight to summary. You're looking for the overarching themes and the main story. You're not interested in what happened in the woods. So when you have a child who is giving you too much detail in your opinion, or let's say, saying something that really you wish they didn't think. I admire Hitler. I had a student tell me that. Um, I'd like to blow up my little brother in the backyard. I've had a student tell me a version of that. Or, grandma is so mean. <laughs> Who's allowed to write grandma is so mean? I, I remember a curriculum had an editing guide that I looked at years ago. And one of the criteria after driving, uh, describing a portrait of a person that is someone in the life of the child, one of the editing tasks was to ensure that whatever you wrote was edifying, was positive, made the person look good. And the moment I saw that, I thought all the pieces written with this criteria are now going to be devoid of writing voice because the second you can't tell the truth, you're hiding. You're not really writing. You are now producing an assignment for someone else's agenda. We have to take the lid off and welcome free rights about farting. <laughs> we have to welcome free rights that hate homeschool. We have to welcome free rights that are obsessed with Elijah Woods because that's all she's thinking about right now. That's the way that we gain access to writing voice. And then, of course, they can learn to adjust the register to take the material and tweak it or reshape it for the audience. Because absolutely, when I first started writing my papers in grad school, sometimes I had very strong reactions. I remember uh, reading this one book that really challenged a way of thinking that literally in the end changed my whole life, like the trajectory of how I think about things. But when I began the class, I didn't agree with any of it. I was writing in the margins of the book. This is unfair. This doesn't apply to me. I don't agree with this. He's off his rocker. That's what I was writing in the margins. When I did my first free write, it was a rant against the perspective of this author. Now, how many times when your kids are given a writing assignment, do they feel free to rant against the perspective of what they're writing about? Just ask yourself that. Can you assign, for example, your child to write a paragraph about a lovely book, a book you loved, Charlotte's Web, 
And the child starts with, I hate A.B. White. I think it's stupid. I don't like the way he writes. This book wasn't satisfying. In fact, I hated the story. And then you dig a little deeper. Well, what'd you hate about it? Well, it's unfair. I don't like that Charlotte died. Tears. Because now you're getting at the truth. But what if you said, well, I don't want to hear about E.B. White. You're supposed to be writing me a summary of what this story is about. But instead, if they gave you, I hate E.B. White. Why would he write a story where my favorite character dies? Well, now there's a conversation to have. And what a much more interesting piece of writing is going to emerge when we actually look at the ways that E.B. White created such powerful ties to a spider, we weep when that spider dies. And what's the theme behind that death? What was the message E.B. White was conveying? What role does Wilbur play in this circle of life moment? These are things you will not get at if your child is being told, we're going to write a summary today. We're going to create a reduced version, you know, sort of a consomme that is a reduction on the stove of my heat and anger. <laughs> Who's ever going to write something good? Uh, so, getting back to grad school, I was working on this paper, and I really disagreed with the author that we had read about. But I had been writing for 40-some years. And when I got to that paper, I knew I was never going to understand this author's insights if I didn't first own up to all my reactivity, the ways that I felt tweaked, I felt judged, I felt blamed, and I thought to myself, I need to get this out first. So I wrote it all down and I wrote it with a full on rant. I let myself have permission to write about what I really thought. And then I read what I wrote so I could see what I really thought because I found out that I don't know what I think until I read it. I'm a big fan of rereading your own writing. I do it all the time. It's really how I know myself. I know myself through the thoughts that tumble through my fingers onto a screen or onto a page in the rereading of them, in hearing how they sound in my ear, not just how they feel when they're bottled up in my body. So I read what I wrote. And then I went back to the prompt and the lectures and the raw material of the book. And I started doing the academic task. I asked myself, is any part of this perspective defensive? Is there an insight I could take from this writer that would dialogue with my reference points and would help me to understand a perspective that is unfamiliar to me, one I've never even known existed, let alone considered? And that's the beginning of a true education. That's what we hope we're doing with our kids. We're not training them to be factory workers who write essays. There's no essay factory out there where they're going to sign up and, you know, at stage one, they make the keyword outline. At stage two, they assign points from predetermined material. At stage three, they're going to organize it into only five paragraphs and it can go nowhere else. Stage four, they're going to tie those together using a certain kind of language. Here are your transitions. Here are your dress-ups. Here are your, you know, clincher words. Like that isn't ever going to be someone's job. And that's not how writing works. So we start with voice. We start with freedom. We start with inviting what's actually there. And then we can do so many cool things with it. We can think about all the different ways to house this raw material so that it impacts readers based on who our audience is. And that's what academic writing invites you to do. And in Brave Writer, because we start with writing voice, by the time we get to academic formats, like the MLA research paper, like the persuasive argumentative paper, like the definition paper, by the time we get to the expository writing that they will do in high school and college, they have full access to their insight generators, to their style, to their sense of confidence when they self-express in writing, and to their point of view. They know what their point of view is so that when they engage with outside material, 
they're engaging with something real and substantive, not a fantasy of what they think the teacher wants. Make sense? Mm, it's a favorite topic. I apologize that I don't have as much vocal variety in the morning. My voice is really groggy, and so I'm trying to drink tea to warm it up because <laughs> I get sick of hearing myself. Someone asks if she can start Brave Rider with an 8th and ninth grader. Absolutely. We've had people start Brave Rider with 18-year-olds. We do the entire spectrum of ages and stages of development. In fact, go to my blog, blog.braverider.com, and in the most popular posts, look up natural stages of growth, and you will see that I did a podcast series with my oldest son, Noah, all about the natural stages of development in writing, and you'll see where your child fits in. Once you know that, we'll just help you slot them into an online class or a product, and you'll be good to go but those will also change your life because you're gonna see writing differently and you'll see your kids so much differently. You'll be more compassionate and more curious and also more impressed with who they are. So that's a great place to start. Uh, Brave Writer has online classes registration coming up in just, um, oh, a couple weeks. It's Monday, December 5th at noon Eastern time that we swing open the door for winter class registration. And those online classes are asynchronous, meaning you can live in Australia or Thailand or Great Britain or Canada or the United States, and you will not have to listen to some delayed recording. Everything we do takes place in a Brave Writer classroom that is password and username protected. You come in, read what's there, go do the work at home when it's the right time of day for your child or you and then come back and type in the work you did. And then the writing coach instructor and your child will dialogue about the writing that was given. You get to read everybody's writing in the class and all the instructor comments on everybody's writing in the class. Some of our classes enroll parents with children. Some of them enroll all the whole family for one tuition. And then some of them enroll just the kid with an instructor and the parent doesn't have to participate. So I homeschooled. I know what I wanted. I wanted all three versions of those kinds of classes. And I didn't want to be required to be home at, uh, to be at home on Tuesday with a headset tied to a computer, downloading technology, watching someone talk at me. What I wanted was maximum flexibility and a place that I could read go away, process, work with my kids, come back, ask a question, know the instructor will give me an answer before I move on to the next phase. And I loved reading all the other information from other parents and reading the ch child's work. Because how can you know if your nine-year-old is doing all right if the only person you have to evaluate is your nine-year-old? But when you get in our classes, we create this writing workshop atmosphere where everybody knows comments on writing are a normal part of the writing process. We all get them. We all enjoy them. We look forward to them. And we grow from them. And we grow by reading someone else's writing too. And everybody together moves through the material at a similar pace. And you can get your questions asked anytime. There's no office hours. Our instructors are available for all the days that the class is open, even on weekends. They literally spend three to six weeks, our classes are three weeks in length, up to six weeks, fully devoted to you and your kids, ready at a drop of a hat to extend to you the kind of help and compassion and support you need to have a great writing life. Our online classes register starting the 5th, but they continue to register until the class is full. Here's what you need to know though. Literally, all of our fall classes filled up before fall ended. Like by the end of October, there wasn't a seat left in our entire fall. And our classes roll out throughout the semester. So second semester starts in January, doesn't end till June, but classes have start dates all through January, all through February, all through March, like that. So you might have a big trip planned 
to go skiing in Colorado in January or February, great. Start taking a class in March or take our Shakespeare family workshop in April or sign up for penning the past at a different time. Like look at our schedule and pick a class that suits your family's lifestyle. If you know your kids are going to go to some select soccer tournament, well, that's not a good month for a class. But if you had to sign up for a semester, wouldn't you feel that, oh, I don't know if I can commit to a whole semester? Well, that's how I lived. I couldn't commit to a semester of anything. The whole point of joining a homeschooling lifestyle for me was to not have to make a semester-long commitment to anything. I wanted to be that little uh, speedboat that could navigate. What is the one family class you recommend if you can't afford all the individual classes? Great question. So I recommend all of them. You can pick the one that sounds best to you, but let's talk about what some of our family classes are. We have a nature journaling class. So you and your kids all submit pictures, all submit writing related to nature. It's a fantastic class. And techniques and ideas and thoughts that you might not have thought to bring with you when you go on that hike. We have a class called Groovy Grammar. All your kids from age five up to 18 can be in this class for one price. And in Groovy Grammar, we flip grammar on its head. Instead of doing all this deductive grammar where we take a sentence and we parse it, we do it inductively. We start with, there are no rules yet. You are going to collect words and assign them categories that make sense to you. Why do we do this? Because we are helping them start to understand the thought process of how people organize and deconstruct the function of words in language. Until your kids have an experience of that, what, what, what does noun even mean? How is that even interesting? But it's very interesting when you're in charge of that project. And we have this opening exercise that we do that involves running through the house and post-it notes that they love. <laughs> and by the end, we use Jabberwocky as a model of a poem written with nonsense language that we can decode because of Lewis Carroll's masterful use and understanding of the function of sound and grammar in a sentence. So that's a fantastic class, highly recommended. Kids love it. And you'll learn something about grammar that you didn't know before too. We also have playing with poetry. And in that class, for some reason, dads who aren't the primary homeschooler show up all the time. The partner who isn't at home all day, they seem to love joining in in this poetry class. So we've had poems written by moms, by kids, and by the second parent. How awesome is that? or by dads and the wife is the second parent. I love it because what we see is a family culture of writing being developed, right? And that's exciting. Yeah, it's an awesome class. And when I say that, you know, two parents, so whatever configuration that is, two parents and kids, or one parent and kids can be in that class. You don't have to have a marriage to be in that class. I, I don't know why, it just sounded unclear to me the way I said it. Your grandmother could be in that class. That would be okay. It's a family class. So anyone who's related to that nuclear family can participate and share their writing. That's the idea. We also have a class that is called the Shakespeare Family Workshop. If you don't know how to introduce Shakespeare in your family, this is the one to do it. Kids build an old globe theater. They go on an internet treasure hunt. They get to watch interesting YouTube clips that showcase the master's acting out scenes from Shakespeare. Suzanne, who teaches the class, is our most senior teacher in Brave Writer. She has a master's in British literature and Shakespeare. So she's phenomenal. And she homeschooled all four of her kids. I mean, she's another one of these brilliant instructors. And in case you don't know, all of our Brave Writer instructors are home educators. How about that? You can't even be a coach for Brave Writer if you haven't homeschooled your kids. That's just a given. Or you have to have been homeschooled. Some of our instructors now are homeschool alumni. And they work for us with the same understanding. Because if you haven't got a relationship to homeschooling, then I don't believe you can give the kind of support parents need in the homeschooling task. So we have homeschool instructors, uh, writing coaches who are homeschoolers, also published writers. Because bottom line, I want people to teach you who understand the way pros think about writing, not how educators think about it. 
That's what creates the transformation in the writing program. In fact, if you're one of those people, you can apply to work for Brave Writer right now. We have a um, call for writing coaches out. You can go to the blog and do a search and find that call for writing coaches. Or you can send an email to help at bravewriter.com and we will send you all the details. We are looking for a few good coaches, okay? So if you are a homeschooler and a good writer and you have a blog, perfect, that's what we're looking for. Somebody who puts their voice out into the writing world, on, out into the reading world on a regular basis. And, uh, and maybe you would be perfect to join our team. Whew! So writing voice, the family classes. I've said groovy grammar. Yes, Paula Horton who is currently on this, uh, this Facebook Live, she is the one in charge of all of those applications. If you want to write to her here in this thread, she will reach out to you. You can also use her email address, which maybe she'll post in this thread. Yay, Paula. Thanks for being there. We are, um, so back to family classes. We have groovy grammar, playing with poetry, nature journaling, Shakespeare family workshop, we also have a class called the Just So Stories. Just So Stories, where your kids have a chance to use Rudyard Kipling stories as a model to write their own Just So Story. And that's a family class. Uh, Antonia, you said now you need to go start a blog. I just want to comment on that. We are interested in you being a published writer, but today there are so many ways to be published. So you can tell me what that means. Were you published in a magazine? Do you run a column for the website that is your husband's business? Are you the person who um, curated a collection of poetry and wrote the foreword? So there are lots of ways to be published today, and I would love it if you think you're qualified, that you look through your life and figure out where that's happening. Sometimes we get caught in this traditional publication loop, but that's not how it is anymore. I just want to know that you know how to write for an audience. That's the goal, okay? So yes, the family classes are phenomenal. I really highly recommend them. I design them with you of the large family in mind because I had five kids and I got tired of paying individual tuitions for everything for everyone. It about killed me. So having a way to tap into writing that allows you to bring all of your kids and do one thing together under one tuition banner seemed the way to go. Okay, so are we good? Writing voice, totally worth, worth cultivating, pursuing, expressing. You can download from my homepage of the Brave Writer website a free writing guide for free. It teaches you the method of free writing birthed by Peter Elbow. And then I give you a whole bunch of prompts that you can use that will be entertaining. It is the perfect tool for the holidays. You know why? Requires no preparation. So instead of just sort of falling off the cliff with writing between now and the new year, you could be doing free writing once a week with some new energi energized prompts, and those will help you feel like you're still accomplishing something. Okay? So that's my gift to you. Go to the homepage, download that. And then lastly, next week is Thanksgiving weekend in the States. We have a tradition that everything that people sell goes on sale on a day called Black Friday. Now we have added another day called Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday is for digital products. Our team is going to open up our holiday gift shop with some specials for Cyber Monday. So if you are interested in buying your friend a gift from Brave Rider, or you want your spouse to buy you something from Brave Rider, there will be an entire shop with gift cards, t-shirt, um, ooh, ooh, something special. Let me see. Do you get to find out early what it is? Ooh, oh, I wonder what this is. Hmm, I wonder what's in here. Hmm, not telling you. You're going to have to come and find out. <laughs> I will give you more hints over the next several days, but we have a brand new product perfect for our Brave Writer community that I think will be really fun, limited edition only for the holidays to share with friends or to put in your own stocking if you want to be good to yourselves. 
and then a whole bunch of other stuff. So to recap, free writing is awesome. Online classes open for registration on Monday, December 5th. We are taking applications for writing coaches right now, and we will have a holiday gift shop opening over the weekend following Thanksgiving with special deals on Cyber Monday. So if you aren't on our mailing list, you want to be. Go to bravewriter.com, click on the download button for those free writing, um, that free writing guide, free writing frenzy, and you will be added to our mailing list and we will be able to help you get those specials, okay? Because they're going to go to the email list. Thanks for joining me today. We will return tomorrow for more A Gracious Face Fall. Live honestly. Write bravely. In fact, write freely. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. Bye, everybody.